The Candid Frame is supported by donations by listeners just like you. Help us to bring you great conversations with great photographers. Support the show today with your monthly contribution through our Patreon effort at patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. This is Ibarri and X, and this is The Candid Frame. When it comes to creativity, many people usually think you can only be good at one thing. It can be hard to realize that a person is not only a photographer, but also a writer, a composer, a musician, a performer, and sometimes all of the above. It all comes from the very same place, but it's just being expressed using another medium. Ali Leroy is that kind of man, who is not only a photographer, but he's also been a stand-up comedian, a writer, a producer, a director, and a showrunner. His work has been seen in television and film, including the Chris Rock Show, Head of State, and Everybody Hates Chris. It's allowed him to work alongside and photograph some of Hollywood's best talents. Ali, welcome to the Candid Frame. It's, I'm really excited to have a chance to talk with you. Thank you for having me. This is very cool. Nice way to start the year. Yeah, it's a beautiful morning here in Altadena, yep, which yep. is nice. Yeah, I'm te- I, you know, I have to say, I was thinking about you, and I was thinking, I'm really tempted to start this conversation by asking him how he kept all his hair. <laughs> I guess got, I, quite, I, think got, I just have a hair gene. You got, a, you got quite the quaff, brother. I admire it. But um, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, researching you and finding out more about you, and, and, and to see all the things you've done. You know, stand up, you're a writer, you're a producer, showrunner, all these things. That sounds impressive. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does. So you, you've been you've been busy. But I, I was thinking that you know, in all those different roles, that probably one of the most important skills has been reading people. Mm-hmm. And I think especially as a photographer, that's that's sort of an important. But I'm kind of curious in terms of in all your various roles that you've played, uh, including a photographer. You know, how important has that ability been to you being successful and being able to do what you, you need to do? Well, if if photography, if if any art is is capturing, you know, a, an idea you know, capturing something that you see or capturing something that you that you felt and then trying to find a way to present it in some form that looks authentic or yeah. that inspires some kind of uh, feeling to other people. You know, I guess it's some sort of innate skill set or, or, or sense, you know, uh, you have to be an active observer, you know, and it's not something I practiced, <laughs> you right. know, but, but yeah, but all, all of that is, is, is observation and then some form of process. And then you kind of spit it back out, you know, through whatever the machinery is that's going on inside your head. I was hearing an interview because uh, you did stand up and you opened up for Bernie Mac yep. and you're good friends with, with yep. him and work with him for a long time. And you tell this interesting story about opening up for him and having to play in front of these huge audiences right. and sort of learning how to sort of command that audience. Right. And I think and it's fascinating to me and I really would love to hear you sort of talk about the ability to be able to sort of command an audience attention, a large audience like that. And then when it comes to producing a portrait of someone... Right. Who's just a, like a single person, right? And being able to do the same same thing. Are you sort of having to use similar sort of skills in order to be able to do that, or are they completely different animals? All right, this is a bizarre question. I'm processing it, but but I'll tell you what I'll tell you the the thing that that connects the two. Okay, the, how does being on a stage in front of five thousand people and shooting a portrait, you know, what do these two things have to do with each other? Creating a a focal point that that's what they have to do with each other. So when I'm on a stage in front of 5,000 people who, who came to see something else, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. That's, the, you know, I'm walking on the stage and I'm there. I'm the guy that's on while they're finding their seats, putting away their coats, getting drinks, getting popcorn, talking to their friends, finding out why somebody's late. <laughs> right. that's, that's when I'm doing my act. <laughs> so... Uh, when I first went out to do that, I, w- I would go out on stage and these are big stages, you know, so, you know, they're 
30 feet across, you know, and I would try to move back and forth across the stage and, you know, and be energetic and you know, try to get everybody's attention. And and what occurred to me <laughs> was that, OK, they're busy, too. Right. Mm hmm. They're doing stuff. They're talking to somebody. They're coming in. They're trying to find a seat. Now I'm up there and I'm running around. <laughs> so what stands out in all of this motion is something that's still right. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's that thing up there doing? That's not moving around. Right. Yeah, that's a person. Why is he being still? Oh, that's the guy. That's where that sound is coming from. That's him. <laughs> OK. What is he saying? <laughs> Oh, OK. So, so you slowly draw them in right. by just being, a, a, you know, a, a focal point. So uh, in photography, specifically for me with portraits, uh, when I when I look at people, a, a lot of times it's, you know, what captured me about them in a moment. Right. Because I think that whatever I saw is something that someone else will see mm -hmm. if I can present it with some sense of clarity, you know, and I mean, in photographic world, you're going to make choices, you know, are you going to take something and process it in black and white? Are you going to do a little post stuff on it? You know, all these options that you have available, but the, but the goal being to enhance perhaps, but not obscure the thing that caught your attention. Because if you can get that thing, yeah. if you can present that thing, then there's a good chance that the people who are sensitive to that thing will see it and respond to it. So when you're engaged, like, for example, I love your your photograph of Deborah Wilson. Oh, I mean, I looked at that photograph and I was just like, I always thought she was a striking woman for people who may not. She's a comedian. She's an actress. She was on Mad TV for a very right, long right, time. Right, right. And she's just a striking woman. Right. But I saw that portrait, and I, you revealed her to me in a way that I'd never seen her before. Oh, that's amazing. And I know that a lot of the people that you photograph are people that you sort of know. Yeah, you know, I tr when, when I when I you know when I'm around people that I know, and you know, uh, it's you. I have access to a different type of personality, so you know, I try and you know photograph them when I can. And I had I'd known of Deborah, but I'd never met her before. Okay, right, and so who I knew her to be visually was something entirely different than what I saw on the, on that day that, that we met. Mm -hmm. It was an entirely different persona and it was striking. It was beautiful. Uh, so that's why, that's what kind of drew me to her. So and, and again, <laughs> I was trying to find a way to, to, to bring that out. So in, in terms of being able to sort of engage with someone, cause that's really a, a big part of, mm -hmm. Creating an effective portrait is right. about. I mean, you can have a beautiful subject, you can have beautiful light, right. but if you're not connected with them, it can be a real difficult process. And, and and in your role, in all your various roles, you're constantly having not only to sort of read people, but be able to get them to do things that you need them to do or right. sort of engage with you. But it's not necessarily like you know a boss telling a, an employee, I, "I need you to do this." Right. It's more about, "I need to." draw this from right you. right like right. when you're directing an actor in, in in an episode of a show it's the very same thing it's about how can i pull out what i need and let's talk about that that portrait or any other portrait you okay. want to talk about how do you sort of go beyond simply just capturing what they look like right and get that thing that that really sort of sparked sure. your interest in the first place uh in in her case uh you know she's already an actress so there is a degree of comfort in front of a camera Right. Uh, a lot of I'm just going to call them civilians for the purpose <laughs> of this conversation. You know, people who are not models or actresses or people who, you know, are not personalities that that trade, you know, in the public eye. So in, in her case, she, she is an actress, but, you know, you're not trying to get her to perform, you know, so I'm, t I'm talking to her. You know, I, you know, I ask her if, uh, you know, uh, you know, first of all, I tell her <laughs> that, I, you know, that I'm really, you know, uh, struck by what I'm seeing. You know, she has all these beautiful tattoos. Uh, you know, she's a, you know, she's a 50 year old black woman. Her head is clean shaven, right? She's got, uh, she, she's thin, so she's got really, really striking eyes and and strong facial features, right? That to me are are very beautiful and attractive in an unconventional way. Right. <laughs> so that's the first thing that that mm -hmm. draws me in. And I imagine that if she's making made this choice as a person to move through the world in this way, you know, then she's probably heard, you know, all manner of and seen all manner of responses to the way she looks. Right. Right. 
as a American black woman, you know, she's moving through the space in an unconventional way. So I'm sure she's accustomed to a range of responses, but I'm betting money that one of them is not, wow, this is beautiful. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So that's thing one. <laughs> I, I, I see you. I, you know, I'm moved by what I see and I want to remember that. I want to capture that. You know, can you help me? <laughs> is really kind of what that idea is. Yeah how you look, what you look like is important to me, right? And for the photograph, that's all we need. You know that this is important to me, right? So then whatever skills that she has as a, as a, as a performer, you know, and, and however she imagines herself when she thinks, because an actress will do this. She, she knows what she thinks she looks like, Mm -hmm. right? Right. So she's going to make an attempt to present that (laughs) consciously or unconsciously. Mm -hmm. This is my good side. I know I think I like my face when it looks like this. You know, what she doesn't know is how she looks in this light. Uh, This particular portrait that that I shot was outside, natural light, late afternoon. So the sun is starting to kind of set, you know, in the, in the Western sky. So that's a very strong, low light. Right. And so it makes, it makes really strong shadows, very strong, you know, uh, very contrasty. Uh, so I found a door, uh, cause I'm now I'm looking for a background. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. We're outside at five o'clock in the afternoon on a sunny day. <laughs> you know, I got her. I'm looking. She's got a white T-shirt on. She's a brown skinned black woman. You know, uh, so I'm like, ah, where do I shoot her? Where do I shoot her? Because I don't want a busy background. I want all mm-hmm. of this to stand out. And I saw a black door. <laughs> like, OK, good. Well, I'll take it. I'll put it in front of this door. Right. So now now that demands that my framing is, you know, so now I got a mid body shot. I don't, I don't have enough space to do head to toe. Right. And I, and, and I did a couple that were a little tighter, but I wanted to see her body. You know, I wanted to at least see from her midsection up. And then I did something that was a little more focused on her shoulders and her face. But it was about the backdrop. Also, I really wanted the attention to be on on her face and and her eyes. She got really, really great yeah. eyes. So a lot of times when I'm, I'm shooting, sometimes I'll I'll uh, ask people to to just just square up, look right at me. I'll put my finger right in the center of my lens before I shoot. Just look right here, mm-hmm. you know. And so it's still I'm talking to them and and drawing them in and making connection. And then I'll pull my finger out of the way and shoot a couple of frames. And you know, or I'll uh, I'll hold the camera with one hand. Uh, I have large hands, so uh, a lot of times I'm able to operate my camera with one hand. Okay. Uh, and use my other hand to uh, create another focal point. So, you know, if I want an eye line, that's one thing. If their head is in a particular position, I can tell them to move their eyes, not their head, move their whole head, mm-hmm. you know, move my hand and, and get them to look where I kind of want them to look and keep talking and, you know, get them relaxed and then shoot, shoot, shoot. So it, it, it can be very engaged, yeah. you know, uh, le- less so when you're working with strangers, but when you're working with somebody that you know. Yeah. You not only photograph actors, but you mm-hmm. also photograph you know, quote unquote, normal people. Right, right. And you made an interesting point about how actors are kind of aware of how they look. Mm-hmm. And I think that everybody is sort of thinks they know how they look in front of the camera. Right. And as a result, you have to sort of fight through that self-perception right. in order to be able to get something, especially with like teenagers, how they automatically give right. you a certain pose right, and right, stuff right, like that. Right. And do you find that there is a different approach that you have to take between a person who is not used to being in front of the camera versus someone who is? Uh, well, yes. Uh, again, when, when you're dealing with uh, performers, however they might, you know, perform, and, and that can be, you know, somebody that's a, a CEO or whatever. You know, again, if they trade in a public space, they may be accustomed to presenting themselves mm-hmm. in a particular way. And so they go, oh, there's a camera. I do this right. <laughs> when someone brings a camera. <laughs> So you have to get them to to not do that. And one of the one of the things I try and do a lot of times when I'm taking portraits is is get the expressionless face, so mm-hmm. to speak. And the attempt is to get someone to stop doing things. Just let your face relax. Don't smile. Don't laugh. Don't think. Just look at my hand. Because a lot of people's faces in in whatever that most relaxed state is. It says a lot. 
Yeah. You know, it just says a lot. Or if I get a laugh, I try to make it a, a natural laugh. You know, uh, fortunately for me, you know, I, you know, I am funny, so I can talk to people and get them to laugh at a thing. You know, I can even get them to laugh at the fact that they don't want to laugh or that it's awkward or whatever mm-hmm. it is. And so you fish a little bit, you know, if you fire off a few frames while that's happening. Uh, but, you know, if you kind of have a sense of what you want, uh, of what your settings are and you kind of get an idea. And so I'm not looking for perfection all the time but i am looking for expression and and you know this you know you can be one five hundredth of a second off <laughs> it's it can be between the shots it can be really close so yeah a, a lot of it sometimes is is trying to get people to engage and relax and and connect because chances are if i was struck by something it was by that person not making any attempt to be something. Yeah. Just being is kind of what I'm looking for. What does that look like? So when did you start picking up a camera? I bought my first camera. It was a Minolta XGM. Oh, yeah. Somewhere around 1980, 1981. Uh, my interest in photography had begun before that, watching uh, my brother who had a brief flirtation with it. Mm-hmm. I don't remember what he shot with, but it may have been a, a twin lens something. I don't remember what. Uh, but that was my first SLR was a Minolta XGM. Oh. But prior to that, you know, we'd had, you remember the, the Kodak, the, the 110 film cartridge oh, cameras? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like we shot that. You may not see my grave, but it's, it's, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> so we had those around the house. Uh, we had Polaroids around the house. So the cameras were present in my family, you know, photo albums, they used to have mm-hmm. photo albums with the cellophane that you'd pull back and sit the yeah. pictures in there. So it was something that that was around. But my first actual physical connection. Uh, oh, you know who else? Somebody else was uh, on my block uh, when I was a kid. A friend of mine's dad uh, used to shoot. He had a camera. And at that time, when I got the Minolta XGM, the camera that was being taught at the time, if I remember correctly, was John McEnroe and the Canon AE-1. AE-1 right. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was the pinnacle. <laughs> they had commercials, and I thought it was cool. I don't know how I ended up being a Nikon guy. But <laughs> when I think about when I think about that camera, I always think about the Stevie Wonder ad they did on <laughs> SNL. <laughs> Yeah. Which if people who are listening have never seen it, Google it on on YouTube. It's hilarious. Yeah. So I had a uh, I had a, the Minolta XGM with a Quantaray. Uh, Quantaray. That's camera. <laughs> yes. I think I had a Quantaray seventy to two hundred zoom, yeah. and maybe a. Uh, I think I also had a Quantaray. 28 millimeter. Okay. Yeah. Oh man. You're taking me back. (laughs) Right. When did you start actively taking pictures more seriously when you were on tour and you're sort of documenting your, your, you know, your life Uh, on the road or did it come even later? Okay. So, so seriously, I'm going to differentiate between actively and seriously. Okay. Right. So I actively started you know, taking photographs, when, you know, when I got that Minolta. So, yeah, I was traveling around a lot. So a, a lot of times I'd have the camera with, you know, so it, it's family trips and, and things like that. But friends, you know, I, I can go back into my files and find negatives of nights where I was just sitting around with my friends and I had my camera and, and I would shoot. Right. Uh, so I, I did that a lot over the course of years. And then when I became active, you know, and started performing and traveling, and you know, start going places. There were a lot of places where I wish I had taken my camera and had shot more. I don't know that I recognized that it was as special at the time, yeah. but it but it was still it was active and it was an ongoing, uh, you know, it was an ongoing, uh, uh, you know, activity. And then when I started to come into contact more and more with, you know, celebrities, minor celebrities and move through that space, then I knew it was important, you know. So then I was I found myself shooting a lot, but not necessarily with a lot of technique. You know, it was the the lowest class of reportage <laughs> that you could do. I was the guy. I was there. I had a camera. I knew how to work it. And so I shot a lot of stuff. When I tell you in the last four years is when I started talking more to other photographers and, and was getting some feedback. I was I was always very afraid to have my work be critiqued. 
or at least sensitive to it because I was in one business where things that I created were being critiqued. Right. Right. I was telling jokes, writing scripts, that type of. So, you know, I'm, I'm feeding this into a system. People tell me everything they don't like about it. And so photography was kind of a safe haven, uh, which is I shoot what I shoot. It is what it is. And I don't have to ask anybody if they like it. You know, but, uh, you know, e- ego and the desire for attention being what it is. <laughs> you, you know, you can only be told so many times that you know, if I did some, show someone something and and there, you know, again, there's civilian responses. You know, this is good. I like that. I do realize that there's value in it. Mm-hmm. Right. This may not be the opinion of, you know, you know, a skilled professional or whatever it is, but just still, it's still a human being right. looking at something, having a response. Right. So that's real. So then I, I actually started to, uh, you know, venture out a little bit more. And, you know, I took a couple of Nikon school classes and started to try and get an idea about, you know, technique, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, which camera I might want to use, uh, you know, what lenses. You know, there was a time when I loved the idea of shooting with a 28 to 300. Seemed cool. <laughs> it seemed cool. You could shoot close and far with this lens. <laughs> Now, oh, yeah, you know, uh, like you know, I'm a primes guy now, right? <laughs> you know, uh, it's it's interesting what you just said about this idea of sort of being a little nervous about the criticism you would get about your photographs because here you are on a stage mm-hmm. in front of thousands of people. Here you are putting out you know scripts mm-hmm. on television. You're constantly getting evaluated and, right. and and judged and critiqued and commented on, right. and it's like. Oh, that doesn't that doesn't make you impervious to criticism no. when it comes to your photography because it's and I think a lot of people who may not have have a, a, as diverse of a resume right. really relate to that idea. I do, I do. I'm really even though I put myself out there all the time when it comes to my, when it's time to me to right. sit down and show my work, right. I feel like I'm opening up my chest. My my wife is an amazing cook. She doesn't want to cook cup, cup, cupcakes for you because she's afraid. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, it's criticism. Nobody likes to be criticized. Nobody wants to, you know, open themselves up, you know, with 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 their art or with their craft and submit it for someone's approval and have it not be met with approval. Okay. <laughs> right. That sucks. <laughs> but yes, in, in, in the battling through that. So once I started showing, you know, more friends, some work. And then a couple of people who, you know, shot also, you know, one in particular was a, a very insistent that I quit, you know, effing around and, you know, just, you know, go ahead. You do this. Yeah. Quit playing. You're serious. So go ahead and act like you're serious about it. It's interesting because I think photography, you're really kind of revealing about something about yourself mm-hmm. when you show these photographs. It's not about just them looking pretty. Right. And stand up. I think it's really about being able to make yourself vulnerable about opening it up. When, it, when of, it's at its best. When it's at, at its best. So what did you learn from observing some of these great stand-ups in terms of being able to do that? Even though they weren't necessarily practicing photography, that whole concept of being able to, that if you want to be able to achieve your best work, you really have to come from an honest place. Did, right. What did you learn from, you know? You can't pander, Right. It doesn't make any difference what your chosen style of expression is, right? So if you're talking about comedy, you know, if you're a political comedian, right, then you have to dive wholeheartedly into your politics and and not try and be sensitive to people who don't care about that, right? Because you were going to lose them anyway, mm-hmm. right? So don't try and pretend like it's something that it's not so you can get them because that's just not their thing. Right. And if you're Gallagher and you like to smash watermelons with a sledgehammer, then go get those watermelons and smash the hell out of them. And the people who like politics just need to go see somebody else, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So just like, you know, be honest about the thing that you like. Don't be embarrassed or don't, you know, uh, uh, hold yourself back. From the thing that that you like that speaks to you, you know, if you're Tyler Perry and what you want to show is old men that wear crazy pants Mm -hmm. (laughs) and they talk loud and they're brash and they mispronounce words, you know, somebody's going to say, I think this should should be something because I don't like the way. And then there's another group of people that go, ask my uncle. Okay, (laughs) right. And so in photography, it's the same thing. I got a 
friends who can, you know, sit out in the backyard and fly some flower petals, mm-hmm. <laughs> but they love it. Right. Yeah. So the way that they, you know, what ca- catches their eye about the pedal and, you know, what time of day was it? How light hits it? Are there dew drops sitting on top of it? Can I move a little closer? Hey, look, there's a bug. They love it. Landscape guys. They go, I'm going to sit here on this hillside for the next six hours and wait for the light to do this. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't do it today, I'm going to come back tomorrow and shoot the same spot where seemingly nothing is happening because something is going to happen, but you got to wait for it. Yeah. Right. And so that's a love. And so it's the same thing. I connect and love expression in people's faces and what their eyes do and what their mouths do. And, and, and where I find beauty, you know, can be in unconventional places. Right what is striking about a person's face. So these are things that are speaking to me right. all the time. I'm always seeing this. I'm seeing the art of somebody's body, how they move. What do their hands do? And so it's pure and authentic. So yeah, whatever your 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 given subject matter is, by becoming more serious, I, I have been able to go, okay, I don't need to waste time shooting landscapes, you know. Okay, if I happen to be at the Grand Canyon and I got my camera and it's 2.30, I'll shoot a shot. But the guy that wants to shoot a landscape is going to wait until something happens because he's got things that he's looking for. You know, it just occurred to me. This is this is literally a revelation. Uh, I was downtown shooting some street photographs a few weeks ago and it was mid to late afternoon so we're talking about two o'clock three o'clock but mm-hmm. i was struck by the quality of the light it was literally was stunning to me and i was like oh it's november it's november in la so when you're in the east coast in november in la you don't tend to be outside just walking around on a 70 degree afternoon <laughs> right right there's clouds in the sky there's snow you're in los angeles <laughs> So it's, you know, it's 65 degrees and you're out and you're walking around and the sun at 3 p.m. in November in L.A. is a lot lower than it is at 3 p.m. in June. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So there's a quality of light that's on the street and the length of the shadows on the ground and the way that it's striking people. It's like, oh, man, if I want to shoot some amazing stuff, I might have to wait till next November. (laughs) But, 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 you know, so in in my, you know, in my, in my search uh, for subject matter as a street photographer, you know, these are the things you begin to learn. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, if I want to get something good, you know, October to, you know, to February in L.A. (laughs) between two and four in the afternoon, you have presented yourself with strong visual opportunities. What things may come across, uh, you don't know, but you have set yourself up for some sort of success just in terms of the elements that you're working with. Yeah, that's what happens when you get serious. Hey, if you're going to be in Los Angeles on the weekend of February 3rd and 4th, come down to the Los Angeles Center of Photography for the culmination of L.A. Street Week. A week-long dedication to street photography ends with two days of presentations by a dozen accomplished street photographers. Photographers will include David Ingraham, Matt Stewart, Renzi Ruiz, Michelle Groskoff, John Free, and Julia Dean. I'll also be doing a presentation on Saturday morning on my work and my own approach to street photography. You can find out more by visiting lacpphoto.org or clicking on the link in the show notes. Hope to see some of you there. One of the things that I, I like about uh, your images is your how you observe light. Mm-hmm. And in, in, so, in a lot of your portraits, uh, your choices in terms of composition. Mm-hmm. Where did you sort of pick that up from? Did that come from working in television and in film or, or, or did you learn from other photographers or where did you start getting a sense that you could do much more than just plant somebody in the middle of the frame and take a, a decent portrait? I I would say it is a combination because I, you know, you know, a, a, a fan of film, you know, and of course a fan of television, but also when I was a kid, it's interesting because I don't know that I studied this in as much as I was exposed to it. Right. And so you begin to develop ideas around it. 
Uh, so when I was a kid, my mother was a big fan of Life magazine, right, which has very strong photojournalism component. You know, pictures tell stories. That's what they did. Uh, she was also a big fan of a look magazine, which was fashion photography. <laughs> right. I did not know that at the time. <laughs> Just flipping through. And she was also a fan of Jet magazine. So the Lamont McLemore oh, Jet yeah. Beauty of the Week <laughs> photographs <laughs> on about page 38 or 39. <laughs> they were they were finely lit <laughs> moments captured of a girl, you know, with a nice body and afro. <laughs> right. But then when you are flipping through Look Magazine and there's a something about how this is being presented and and you know that it's different. You don't know why that it's different. The, The first photograph I can remember sticking with me is the little girl from Vietnam. Oh, yeah. Right. Like that's the first photograph I can remember sticking with me. And so so you're talking about composition. And again, composition is, is focal points. What what am I looking at? Why? What's adding to it? What's distracting from it? You know, is that larger photograph, is the photograph in and of itself a thing? Is the fact that it's busy, is that something, mm-hmm. right? Is the fact that there's no focal point, you know, what does that force you to look at? There was a long time ago, there was a, uh, they used to have in a Sunday paper, I think, they would have, it wasn't a puzzle, but it was a, a, a graphic and the graphic had lots of shaded dots in it. So the thing was, if you looked at it long enough, yeah. you, it would slowly begin to come to you what the image was inside the graphic. But you'd have to stare at it until everything else started to fall away and whatever the subtle differences between the shades of gray are you know, started to make this thing that was in there kind of come alive. And so, uh, you know, it's it's a very abstract way of thinking about things, but just inside of a frame, Mm -hmm. you know, there are all of these elements and they they push you to look at one thing. You know, the light drives your eye in a particular direction. The color pulls you in a particular direction. Does someone have a, a quality that you're trying to, you know, illuminate? Does the lack of information in a particular part of a frame. So so it is it's focal points, focal points, focal points. What is the thing you're trying to bring out and and what are the things that add or subtract from that? You know, in, in researching you and seeing your career and 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 it seems like you've been pretty good about striking when the iron is hot, being able to take an opportunity and sort of launch it into other opportunities. Maybe not so much out of a, 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 a thoughtful plan, right? but just being able to sort of <laughs> leverage it. And unfortunately for myself, I've often failed to take advantage of it, of those opportunities. And uh, in retrospect, I go, what was I thinking? You know, because I guess I get so focused on, on that exact moment. But, you know, you've had so many different roles in your life right. in terms of your career, I'm I'm really curious to hear how important that's that's been because I know that people listening may be just interested in photography, but I think the whole idea of being able to create an opportunity for yourself and then being able to leverage it to something else is something that a lot of photographers aren't really good at. And <laughs> I'm really curious as how how you've seen how you've seen and how you've used that to your to your advantage. It's it's a very frustrating process, you know, if not to yourself, certainly to other people around you mm-hmm. <laughs> who would like you to just, you know, do one thing right. <laughs> so that they can concentrate on on helping you do that thing or at least building some sort of experience around the fact that you insist on doing this thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so the life that you lead as a as a stand up comic has an impact on your family or the one that you lead as a television writer has a different one or, or the one that you lead as a photographer can we just be on vacation because we're walking down yeah. the street and I stop every 14 seconds because I see something you know I get left a lot <laughs> you know and, and I and at some point I had to begin to understand the frustrations like yeah we'd like to be here with you but when you have that camera in your hand we know that you're with the camera and right. the camera wins a lot <laughs> right I, I guess I guess if you are, you know, if you're moving through the space of different forms of expression and and you are being serious about it. And again, not just active, mm-hmm. but but serious, 
you know, what I think occurs is that at some point, you know that you can't not do it. That, that, and that's really what it is. Yeah. There comes a point when you can't not do it. You know, I have, you know, moved through this space of photography now for a few years in a very serious way. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll say it like this. I think it's a crime against myself <laughs> if I don't take this this work that I spend this time on, you know, thinking about you know, laying up in the bed at night, looking at, you know, looking at other people's work and trying mm-hmm. to understand how people accomplish things, trying to figure out what I'm not good at. What do I want to continue to do? I got a list of, you know, 15, 20 different personal projects that I think I might want to do. And then I rethink it and go, why do I want to do? Why do I want to do this project? What difference does it make? And even if this is not something that's going to be held in the highest regard, what I do understand about the work is that it does make a difference. You know, it does matter when you walk into a, a, a space and you go, oh, OK, uh, I don't see a woman like Deborah Wilson being shown and being presented as something interesting and, and, and beautiful and, and worthy of capturing <laughs> And and presenting. So, you know, OK, that's something. Right. She appreciates that. I appreciate that. And I'm sure there's a, you know, a million or two more million more people like us. Right. <laughs> and if you take that and you print it and you frame it and if it's in your garage and you die <laughs> mm-hmm. and then somebody goes in there and then you're Vivian Meyer and somebody goes, oh, my God, look at this. So it's it's a, it's a, it's an importance beyond I think even the 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 space that we inhabit or or the time that we're here. It's it's storytelling. It's it's recording. It's it's history. And it the the value of the photograph is is, is well, it's never in the moment. It absolutely unconditionally is never in the moment. Mm-hmm. When you were standing there taking that frame, it was happening. The fact that you stood there and recorded that frame and then that moment goes away, you know, what? Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X did what? They were at a soda shop and they were play boxing. (laughs) What? (laughs) Yeah, it's 50 years later. I have that photograph and now it's something. Yeah. And with each passing year, at the time you looked at, ah, it was too bright and the thing. And I, I got Ali was a little bit out of focus and his hand was blurred and I was trying to do this. And then the time goes by. And then you're the only person that has it right? <laughs> because you were there. So you have an opportunity in your role to observe other photographers, mm-hmm. either because you're in front of the camera or you're observing them while they're taking photographs of your cast members and stuff like that. So you probably observe photographers with a critical eye in terms of what they're doing, mm-hmm. in terms of what you can learn. Right. Go, you know, going back to the whole thing about sort of being able to elicit something from right. someone. What have you observed other photographers do, you know, well and badly that you've learned from? Quality over quantity, right? That's that's thing one. Having a sense of when or if something might occur that you, the artist, are drawn to and have an ability to capture with some level of efficiency, right? So again, it's the landscape thing or whatever, you know, somebody knows how to do that. They know how to prepare themselves. They know where to go. They understand what vantage points are. Mm-hmm. They understand what makes a good, you know, uh, a composition in terms of uh, perspective. You know, how high or low are you? You know, where should you be in relation to the sun? It's just what's going through their heads. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I, I'm on a guy that's, uh, you know, I'm on, I'm on a television set and there are people there whose job it is to uh, make still photographs for press packages. Right. That's not my job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what I can learn from them is how do they interact with the production? Right. How do they kind of take themselves out of the flow of activity and be there but not be in the way? How do they engage with the actors in a way that's uh, intimate and not, and not intrusive? You know, how do they manage to 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 make the photographs that they do without having people mugging for the camera all the time and, you know, kind of disappear into the background? People know you're there, but give them a sense of comfort that, you know, that you aren't going to expose them or record them in a way that they feel is unflattering. <laughs> right. This is there's a trust. Right. So, you know, so how do you insinuate yourself into this trust and then create a creative space so that you can do something that you do, 
that is different than one that, but you know, this person shooting photos for the press packet, right? That's not what I'm here to do, right? Right? I'm I'm here, you know, looking to to record some 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 moments, something that feels personal and intimate about what it was like to be, you know, on this set at this time, you know. So, Yul Brenner has a, a book of, of uh, photographs that he made, you know, in his time on set. So, Jeff Bridges has an amazing right. book that he shot with the Wide Lux. Jerry Bruckheimer. Really? <laughs> Jerry Bruckheimer's got, uh, well, I don't know that it's a published book, but since I've had the uh, occasion to be, <laughs> uh, you know, in an office, uh, you know, he's on sets. He's got, he shoots a lot. Uh, ben Stiller. Ben, yeah. Uh, yeah, very active uh, shooter. So, again, it's it's the way that people interact with the production, with the other people. What kind of trust are they able to build, you know? So at some point, you know, I come onto a production, you know, that first day here I am and I got my camera, you know, and depending on how many days and sometimes years it is, people just get accustomed to it. I got my camera, I'm laying around, I'm shooting, they stop paying attention to me. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm asking specifically uh, uh, for shots and other times I'm just kind of there. And, and you know, again, you know, there, there's a there's there's a trust. So in watching people who are creating and working in a space where you would like to work or where you can imagine you might be able to create something, how they interact with the environment and with their subjects is the, is the first thing to learn. And then the second thing to learn, you know, if you sit down and talk to them, then it becomes, you know, maybe certain technical things, you know, if we're talking, you know, people who are shooting film, you know, you know, what type of film stocks are you using? What type of settings are, are you working with? You know, how does that work with or against the lighting that's available? Right. <laughs> you know, how noisy is your camera? You know, <laughs> you know, some people are using quiet boxes, but if you don't, you know, I'm not going to get a quiet box. But I, I, I got to get a quiet camera. <laughs> 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 right. You know, so what is that? So that's that's a big thing of just kind of getting an understanding of of technically what do you need to be able to do to get your work done? Okay. And then, you know, it's sort of in an abstract way. You know, how do you need to think, interact with the space and the people in order to, to get the work done? Right. Well, you're an amazingly busy man doing all these things. How do you make sure you find time for your own photography? Um, I do a combination of things like I will sign up for a class. Now, I might find that other demands prevent me from being able to get there as much as I thought I would. And I, I sometimes would think that, you know, in, in, the, in the purest sense, you're not going to the class to necessarily learn photography, but you are going to be part of a community and talk with people about your work and, and be engaged on that level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I join a class then you know, maybe we'll have a couple of shoot dates and a couple of projects. And it literally just forces me to take a Saturday that I might have spent, I don't know, at Target and, you know, and running some errands, things right. that my wife wants me to do. <laughs> There's no shortage of that. The there? whole Saturday <laughs> I can spend making my wife happy or... <laughs> Happy wife, happy life. Uh, <laughs> you know, that is really true. <laughs> that is very true. I've learned that the hard way, but I've learned it. Uh, so, you know, but but to get out on a Saturday afternoon and you go, we're going to meet at Union Station. We're going to shoot Union Station for three hours. And then we're going to go get some, you know, beer or coffee or whatever and sit down and talk about what we did or did not get. So that's one way of doing it. I literally have a camera with me 100% of the time. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I always have, you know, and sometimes two or three. <laughs> I'm, I'm geeky, nerdy tech guy, whatever, yeah. you know. But, you know, I got a film camera sitting in the car right now and a digital something in my bag. Right. Because sometimes I'm just looking for an opportunity to use a piece of gear in a way that I think, you know, would be flattering to both the subject matter and a great use of the gear. Right. Right. So sometimes I want to shoot film. I cannot tell you. I just bought a, if you, you see it over there, a Bessa, uh, our Bessa one. Oh, uh, oh the yeah. Folder. Yeah. yeah, just, yeah. Just bought it. it shoots six by nine frames. I want to do that. <laughs> Now, I don't know <laughs> when I'm going to have the hour that it's going to take to go and unfold this camera <laughs> and look through that tiny viewfinder and the triangle right. focus marks <laughs> and and do my sunny 16 <laughs> settings <laughs> and try and remember what film I put in there gotcha. and shoot six, six by nine frames. But I'm excited about the prospect. But what I do know is that, OK, 
I've moved through Union Station now a bunch of times. I've walked up and down, you know, the streets of downtown Los Angeles a number of times. I know what things are interesting to me there. Mm -hmm. I know where the beautiful wall is, right? I know that I can go up into the Disney Center uh, and walk through certain little aisles and pass and that the exterior of the building is available to the public. You know, it's not a widely known fact, right? right? These are things I know. You know, I know what it's like to go and shoot up on Hollywood and Highland. The difference between west of a vine or east of vine. <laughs> Those are the things. So as you go out and you're compiling all of this information, and again, what it's doing is that it's giving you tools to go out and find a situation or a circumstance where you might be able to make some, you know, some interesting photographs. But yeah, classes keep your gear with you. And sometimes you just got to pull over to the side of the road on your way to someplace Absolutely. and get out and shoot it. Yeah. How many times have you driven past something? That's cool. That's cool. That's interesting. That's cool. That's cool. That's interesting. And you don't stop. Yeah. Sometimes you got to stop. Sometimes you got to stop. Yeah. I saw there's a, there's a road that I drive down on my way to work every day. And I don't know why, but it caught my eye. It's just sad. But, you know, clearly there was a roadside accident of some sort. And so someone put a little memorial on the side of the road. It's just in the most unlikely place. And so there's a, you know, there's a cross there and it's got some flowers and some candles and there's a Santa Claus hat on the top. So I'm assuming this happened right around the holidays. And I keep driving past it, driving past it. I'm like, I got to stop. I, shoot, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I think I need to shoot that. But it's like, it's a real thing and it's going to go away. All right. You know, and one day I'm going to drive past and it's not going to be there. And that's going to be the day I'm going to go, damn it, I should have stopped. You remember the old photo mat kiosk at the head off of Altadena and mm -hmm. Lake? Yeah. I, same thing. I had walked by it, driven by it dozens of times. And right. I finally went one day, I need to make a picture of this thing. Right. Because it wasn't a photo mat anymore. It had at one point right. been used to sell like cigarettes. Right, and stuff, right, right. But now it wasn't being used at all. And I finally took a nice photograph of it. And then next month they did the remodel and it was gone. Right. Right. And it just reminded me, it's like when I feel the impulse to make the photograph, make the photograph. Because yeah. it's not going to be promised, it's going to be there. Will you do something with it? Who knows? Yeah. Right? And that includes photographing people. Yes. At a hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. And and it and, and specifically with the people, it's it's fighting through uh I'm gonna call it embarrassment. You know, yeah. As, as as photographers, I think sometimes we we have a sense that maybe we're being intrusive, or you know, we don't seem like the nerdy person that wants to take a picture of somebody who probably has you know a thousand photographs made of them on a regular basis, right? And we don't want to be the uh, yeah. excuse me, can I? Would you mind if I? They can say no, you know, but if they say yes, <laughs> the question is: here's what's here's what's interesting, especially if 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 you're that type of a, photographer that likes to work with people if you have a thing that you know you like to do you know and you don't want to run up against trying to you know uh, manipulate your subject into doing something that they feel uncomfortable with it's it's trying to find the quick marriage of here's something that i think i'm trying to capture and they're going to give me something that they think they want me to have mm -hmm. and you know how many frames can i get off between what they're trying to give me and what i want to get right but at the end of this session which could be you know 2 minutes of would you mind if i took a few photographs yeah you could got something. And when you have something, <laughs> you know, now you can get to work. Yeah. You know, I don't have, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not a purist. I'm just not. And what I have learned, uh, uh, Man Ray, I saw uh, there was an exhibit that I encountered someplace and they had uh, his contact sheets. And, and what I was fascinated by was the grease pencil work. You know, mm -hmm. here's the frame. And here's the photograph. Right. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, when people talk about things like cropping and what's this, eh, I don't, I don't, I don't ascribe to that way of thinking because again, when you're talking about any individual, it's what did they see and what do they want to show? Point. Right. Yeah. And different people have different skill sets. You know, do we want to rob the world of what, you know, Chick Corea is able to do with a synthesizer? <laughs> because some other guy thinks that the piano is the purest form of, you know, instrumentation for a big thing with keys on it. 
Well, my last question that I ask each guest, I ask them to recommend another photographer for listeners to discover and explore on their own. And it can be anybody, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Well, for me, I'm going to say Eli Reed. Eli, yeah. (laughs) I've just recently come across, uh, you know, some of his work. And as a as a black man moving through this space. Right. And I mean, he's he's functionally a contemporary photographer. You know, I think he's still with us. Yeah. 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 Right. So it's one thing to look at, you know, work that you've seen from, you know, Gordon Parks and and, you know, it is the 40s or 50s and, and that space is not available to us. Those people aren't available to us. That that experience is gone. And and Eli Reed moves through that same space. We have a culture that has not been, uh, I, I think, captured, recognized, seen with as much depth, clarity and volume <laughs> as the larger culture around us, you know. So when you're talking about, you know, Frank and some of those people who are, uh, you know, the Americans and all these, you know, Mm -hmm. pieces of work that really talk about this larger American experience. And functionally, you know, black people have, we're subculture, you know, in the way that, certainly in the way that we are are recorded and presented, (laughs) you know, so I like that he has work that moves through that space that is is done with care, that is done with interest, where it's not black. You know, I, I always hate the idea of certain photographers going into a community and treating their subjects as some sort of anomaly. Oh, wow. This is so fascinating. These people mm-hmm. who live this way that we don't live. Look at that. This is curious. <laughs> That's so different from. I know who these people are. I, I have experienced the joys that they've experienced. I've experienced the pains that they've experienced. I know what their what their normal is. So, you know, how do you show things that, you know, might be sad but aren't sad in the way that the people who live and move through those spaces, you know, might see it? So, yeah, here's, here's some kids playing in a vacant lot. What's important, that it's a vacant lot or that the kids are playing? Right. Mm -hmm. Are they happy? How are they happy? What are they you know, how are they moving through this space? And what is the thing that you're supposed to get from this? Right. So a a lot of his work and some of the stuff that I've been looking at just kind of moves through, you know, moves through. It's 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 a real consideration for black people. This is the way I'm seeing it. This may not be his intent, but it, it seems to be a real consideration and desire to to show black people in a very humane and and contemporary and, and real way. You know, I seek to do some of that. I don't necessarily operate in the same space. But when I look at his work, I'm inspired by that. And what I do realize also is that part of that is you you have to be there. You have to connect. You know, I can't be here in, in Los Angeles and just thinking that's cool. You know, I might have to go to Detroit. <laughs> And stay someplace for a week. You might have to familiarize yourself. I might have to go down to Englewood and I can't just go and pop in on a Saturday afternoon. It's going to take me 20 Saturdays so that that guy at that shop gets to know me. And then I got to come back again and tell him what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And then, you know, can I insinuate myself into this activity where it's photographs are scary to people. Especially in this yeah. space that we live in now, and, and, and you know, and, and I don't, I don't want to go on and on about it, but why are you taking a picture? A lot of people want to know that. Why? Especially if you're on the lower end of the economic ladder. Oh, what's going on with these pictures? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> because I don't see myself as someone, or I don't think that I'm doing anything that's worthy of being recorded. So if I don't think that it has any value of being recorded, certainly not to me, then what value does it have to you? Why are you doing this? Yeah. <laughs> you're not in my family. <laughs> You're not going to bring this to the Thanksgiving yeah. <laughs> dinner and say, this is the day we were out playing at the fire hydrant. <laughs> Man, I don't know you. <laughs> well, thank you, brother. It really was an enjoyable time to, to sit down and talk with you. Thank you for Thank you so here. much for having me, man. This is, this is inspiring. It actually makes me want to go out and make some more photographs. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. 
thanks for listening and thanks to Ali for joining us on The Candid Frame. You can check out his work on Instagram at Mr. Leroy. That's spelled M-I-S-T-E-R-L-E-R-O-I. Or click on the link in the show notes. Thanks for your continued support of The Candid Frame. If you haven't already, please take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. Your ratings and comments help people to discover the great conversations like the one you heard today. Thanks to Romo Rossi, 86 Steelers 43, and Joe BHN for their five-star reviews. You can also support the show by making a regular monthly contribution through Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash the Candid Frame, or you'll find a link in the show notes and the Candid Frame website. Or if you just want to make a one-time contribution to the show, you can do so via PayPal by clicking on the donate button on the Candid Frame website or in the show notes. Thanks to all who have recently contributed to the show, including Summers Moore, Joe Sharp, and Brett Fox. We are so appreciative to have you as listeners and supporters. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app available for Apple iOS, Android, and Windows. Links for each can be found in the show notes and the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram at simply at IbarianX. Remember to help spread the word. And this is IbarianX, and this is The Candid Frame.